My name is uh, Paul. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, reflection techniques in uh, C++. So, I um, guess starting off, um, kind of the question is what is uh, for reflection? Perhaps for people who don't, are not fully aware of what reflection does. Reflection essentially is basically introspection on types. Or even, you could go even as far as introspection on not just the types, but the, the um, the, even the AST, you know, you could go over classes and functions and namespaces. But in general, when most people talk about reflection, they're usually talking about some kind of reflection on, on the class types, finding out what kind of members are available. Usually, generally, it involves, you know, enum enumerating over uh, class members. Um, so, like, you know, iterating over each of the, the class members. Um, it is not really, most people when they refer to reflection, they're not really referring to a predicate-based introspection in the sense of deciding, oh, whether this class has this function foo or not. Um, that's already kind of pretty much kind of a solved problem in C++ for most cases to figure out how to do. So generally most people when they refer to reflection are referring to more being able to enumerate over each of the members. So. Essentially, what by being able to actually introspect over on the types, it gives us a way to actually treat our data as pure, write it as pure C++ classes, which gives us an extra level of type safety when we're dealing with certain data-driven type of applications. Um, in, in C++, or actually in this talk here, we're going to actually focus mainly on, on the reflection data at compile time, meaning we're going to basically use data that's technically only available at compile time. We're not going to worry about injecting reflection data into the runtime. Um, uh, I mean, C++ as a language is uh, designed as like you pay for what you don't use. So in general, compile time reflection can kind of give you that, uh, that kind of uh, uh, guarantee. Um, once you have compile time reflection, you could, if you needed the runtime capability, you could go uh, uh, turn around and then generate runtime data structures at, at uh, runtime using the compile time data. But for this talk, we're just mainly going to uh, focus on the compile time data. Also, right now, we're actually going to use, we are going to use current C++ features. But right now, currently, there's no native language feature for reflection for C++. So in general, when we're going to rely on it, we're going to, we're, we're going to actually mostly try to annotate our classes with the metadata that we need in a way. Um, there is a study group that's working on a proposal for adding reflection for C++, which will actually help in the future to simplify a lot of these examples of what we're doing. So the next thing is to look at is uh, uses. Uh, what are some uses for reflection? So the first one is uh, serialization, like say to JSON or XML or some other kind of format. When we do this with reflection, in general, we're going to treat, like a lot of times you can just treat the name of the fields uh, either as like object keys for your JSON object or as tag names uh, for the XML. And that, that kind of can uh, generally helps a lot with uh, treating your your class directly as like almost a, a JSON object. So, um, uh, and we'll actually look here in this talk as a simple example of how we could like serialize it out to XML actually. So, the ne uh, as we go even further with doing uh, 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 reflection, we can also look at uh, object relationship mapping to say we want to actually represent not just the class serializing out to some kind of data format, but we can actually look at relating it to a table. But this actually introduces some new things that uh, most people don't think about as far as like, yeah, you could treat each you know, field name as a column in the database, but there's all these other little attributes that you need to know about the columns in the database. Like, oh, is this a primary key? Perhaps this only can hoard 250 you know, string character length. There's all this, or maybe this is a foreign key related to this other um, uh, class. So there's all these other little type of annotations that you want to be able to add um, about the fields. And we'll actually take a look at an example of possibly doing that on a small level. We won't, we won't implement a full object relationship mapping because we don't have the full time to do that. But we will look at on a smart, smaller scale, a smaller example of how we can annotate the class and even create database tables and things like that. So 
Even further, this could actually apply to any kind of general data-driven development. So those are two like well-known examples of serialization, but actually can apply to, you know, you could actually create a, a command line parsing library and, and all of your command line args or fields in a struct or whatever. Um, so you can kind of you can kind of expand out if you think of if you think if you actually can describe your problem in a data-driven way, in a data way, then you can now treat your uh, your code as data and you get extra type safety from that. So some of the techniques we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at three different techniques. The first one is using Boost Fusion. Uh, second one, Visitor Pattern. And then kind of at the very end, we'll do like a do-it-yourself, I call it. But it's just we're just going to use some uh, self-made macros and a little bit of metaprogramming to kind of generate the metadata that we want. So um, starting off here with Boost Fusion. Uh, Boost Fusion is essentially a heterogeneous sequence library. It's kind of way of describing it better is uh, generic algorithms for tuples. But the tuples aren't just stood tuples. These tuples could apply to many different types of tuples. So starting off uh, as a simple example of understanding how the library works, this is kind of an example right off of uh, Boost, um, uh, Boost Fusion's uh, documentation right off their quick start guide. So we, you know, we can create a make tuple and in Boost Fusion, instead of calling std get, you actually use this at c0, at c1, at c2 to kind of get the index for each of the, um, uh, the elements in the tuple. So that's kind of how it works in there. But even further, it's, uh, it goes much further than what the standard library can do because you have algorithms, for example, like for each. So say for instance you wanted to print XML, you could actually take your original tuple, print XML. Now in this example, we're just using type ID name like they do in the quick start guide. This is not really a portable, uh, fully portable way of doing that, but it's just for kind of a simple illustration purposes how you can take a tuple and, and iterate over it. Uh, we use the Lambda auto because the auto, it could be a different type, it could be an int, it could be a string. So we use the uh, auto there for that. But we can't, like Boost Fusion algorithms don't just apply to stood tuples, like I said. You can actually extend it to many other uh, classes. And one of the things that are very much tuple-like, of course, are structs. So um, as an example, Boost Fusion actually provides right there an adapt struct. So you can actually define your struct and then adapt it. So then, um, so then you can actually get this treated basically in, in, inside of Boost Fusion algorithms. But even to go even further, if you don't like repeating code, Boost Fusion actually provides like a defined struct. So you can actually go in and um, uh, uh, it will actually define the struct and adapt it both at the same time. Um, so, so once we actually have it adapted, just as a quick example, uh, we can actually turn around, create a struct, and now we can actually access the elements using the at C uh, function so we can actually access the first element using at c0 kind of thing and then we can even turn around and call the print XML function but ideally like you saw the problem with print XML we actually want to be able to um, instead of printing out type ID names which is uh, which ideally usually the type is not what we want to use and also type ID dot names not portable but ideally what we want to use is the name so once we start adapting it adapting a struct we, uh, Boost Fusion actually provides a function called struct uh, member name uh, that we can actually get the name of each of the elements. So we can call struct member name, pass in the name of the struct, and then an index to it. And we can actually call the call and it will actually give us the member name. So, yes? It's not an implementation detail. Okay. But, um, uh, he was asking if it was part of the public API or if it was an implementation detail, but it's not an implementation detail. Now, um, uh, so now when we're actually getting the uh, names, um, uh, we actually, besides just getting the names, we actually want to basically, when we're doing the for each, we want to basically iterate over it to have both the name and the value corresponding. So what we want to do is actually zip those names together with uh, their value. So essentially kind of what we want to do conceptually, uh, down at the bottom there I show like a, a stood make tuple kind of uh, idea of how it would kind of look. 
um, uh, it's not actually going to be a tuple, but it's kind of to conceptualize kind of how when you zip them together, how it would look. So basically, you're going to have a tuple, and inside inside of that tuple will be another tuple that will first hoard the name and then also the string of the, or, or I'm sorry, first hoard the value and then it will hoard uh, the name of it. So to do this, um, we can create a with names function that will actually return us back that will zip these both things together. So the first to start off, we actually use, first we need to get a range of in, uh, indexes. So to do that, we can actually just use boost MPL range C. It actually will build us a sequence of indexes. So we just create index sequences from int, from zero, and then we, we can actually get the size of the struct by calling result of colon colon size struct. It has to be result of colon colon. It's kind of a relic of the, the legacy boost fusion, but that's the way you have to do it. So we call result of colon colon size struct, and we can get the basically indexes that we can call in. Next, once we have those, we'll actually transform each of those indexes into the name. So we call transform, we pass the range into there, and then we take our index, which the lambda uses the auto i there, and we just uh, call that into the struct member name there. Um, and then that just gives us our names, and then we zip those two together. So when we, when we have those, when we want to actually get the value or get the name, we could use directly the at c0, at c1, but using magic numbers everywhere um, in general, um, don't usually look quite as clear. So we can actually make these set of functions to actually, that we can actually call instead. So once we have one of the elements, we can call at C0, and that will actually return us back the uh, value in at C1, which will give us the name. So now, once we have all that in place, we can actually go back to our print XML function, and we can actually start implementing it such where we actually use the name of the member fields for uh, printing out the XML. So in this example here, we just call for each with the names and we can now use get name, get value, or actually get name mainly for the tag. And so if we run the print XML and we use it with the person class, we can actually get an output like what is shown there at the bottom. So now uh, going even further uh, with more of what Boost Fusion is capable of doing, Boost Fusion has this idea of associative uh, sequences, They're essentially like tuple, associative tuples in a way. They're, they're pretty much like, um, like, in some ways, like stood map, you know. But rather than having the keys um, being some kind of value, in general, the keys are actually just a type. So by giving it that type, you can actually look up the corresponding value in, in the map. So we can build the fields, you know, name and age is two different uh, structs, two different types for each of those, and we can actually build the map together uh, with using the pair, you have to use the fusion pair to do this. And then instead of us accessing the fields using uh, like at C0 for each one or at C1, we can actually use actual names for them. So we can do like at key fields name and actually get the name so it's, it, it is a little bit more readable. But in general, you can even just take a struct and you can actually turn around and actually still adapt that to an associative sequence as well. So it has a, actually has a defined associative sequence, so it will actually define the struct and then we can actually pass in what we want the keys to each of those structs is. And this is kind of important when we're wanting to actually add attributes. And at the same time, we can, uh, when we extend the, with, uh, with what we did with the with names, we can actually extend it even further and give it the key, the corresponding key. So when we adapt it with keys, uh, Boost Fusion actually provides a struct associative key that we can go out and query and find out what the corresponding key is for the struct. And so we can, it basically does the same process. It takes that range, transforms it to the keys, and then it zips those two together, or three together, actually. And then we can add uh, get key as an extra function for what we do. And kind of what this is gearing towards is being able to have a way that we can store attributes. So like when we're doing, like say, object relationship mapping, like I said, we want to be able to annotate the fields to be able to recognize this is a primary key, this, is, this has this other attribute. So as a simple example, here we can actually build types that represent certain attributes like primary key, also max length, which we actually store as a, uh, 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 a template perimeter here. And we use the max length base, base 
we inherit from there so that we can actually have one concrete type that we can use to recognize the attribute with. So once we have that, to actually incorporate it into the keys, we can just inherit. So once we have the keys like name, we want to make name a primary key. We just inherit from primary key. And then we also inherit from max length 250 to say we want a maximum length of 250. And then we turn around and we can define our associative struct and it will actually have the annotations that we want along with it. So, um, so now we can, we can annotate our, our keys, but the next thing we need to be able to do is actually start uh, checking for attributes that we've added in there. So because we want like a check uh, or has attribute function to actually check to see if one of the keys has attribute, we can actually, the standard library provides is base of that can actually tell us, oh, okay, this, uh, this uh, attribute, or I'm sorry, this key inherits from this attribute. So that's what the has attribute function does there. And then you can see an example at the bottom where you can do with primary key without and it will return true or false there. Um, now, when we start wanting to retrieve certain values from the keys, like say for example, um, we want to be able to get what pos the possible max length is. So if there is a max length, ideally what we want to do is actually return back what max length value was specified. Otherwise, maybe we return back a minus one and we'll just use that as kind of a, a, a sentinel value to know that a max length value wasn't set. So to be able to do that, um, we can't, we, uh, obviously C++ doesn't have st static uh, if to be able to easily do that. So instead we have to do function overloading. So we create function overloading for, okay, when it has attribute max length, and then we make another overload for when it doesn't have uh, uh, max uh, length as well. And then here in the example code, I use, um, I use a little uh, macro usually to kind of abstract out the, all the enable if craziness usually. So it makes it a little bit neater and easier to read, I think. So now that we have all that, we can actually start looking at maybe creating a database table. So if we want to create, so we can create this function that basically will spit out what the create table, table function would be that we could send off to a database to actually create the corresponding table for a person. So in this case here, it, it takes the uh, uh, the TX or whatever will be the person class in this example, and then we actually pass in a corresponding table name. And so then we just would iterate over each of the, each of the uh, um, elements with the names and keys with the fields, and then it calls the create column field. And this is kind of where most of the main uh, functionality is at. So in this example here, uh, I just take and check, first I check to see, oh hey, is the value convertible to a string? It basically, ideally, it's just like a string type, essentially. If it is, then we want to be able to get a max length attribute with it so that we can actually print out, as an example, you know, char, whatever amount that you do, usually do on databases. Or if it doesn't have a max, like we check max less than zero, then we just specify it as text, which means it's unlimited amount. So basically, you can use the attribute to do that. And then at the end, too, um, I, right now I use type ID for, for all the other ones to print out the type name. Ideally, if you're doing actual object relationship mapping, you'll need to actually create like a, a relationship between like integers and strings to what they're called in the, the database. Right now I just do type ID name. But, um, Quick question. Yeah. So you've shown an example for fusion, your, uh, with fusion, you're, you're uh, pairing in a mapping of the field name with the, the value. Yeah. Oh, with, oh, does Boost Fusion have a thing to do the type ID? Um, no, Boost Fusion does not have a capability for converting like a, a, like a, a type to a string. Um, so you would have to essentially write your own kind of mechanism. Or you could, if you're using these macros, you could build a macro on top of it that adds like a you know, static const name. Huh? Oh, okay, if you use a third tuple element. Well, in general, because it's only the name is actually only essentially associated with the, the type and not each of the fields, you wouldn't associate it with each of the fields. So 
rather when you define your struct, what you can do is just, if you want to put a name for, for that type, you could do that. Now, uh, I guess you could say when you eat for each of the fields for the type, you have the name of the field and then the type of the name. But essentially, because you know the type, instead it would just be better to create a function that would take that type and then map it over to... Type traits. Yeah, some kind of type trait that would map that over. So you could be like, okay, if it's an integral type, go ahead and return uh, string int. You know, if it's convertible to string, return uh, like a string as well. So that's, that's what you could do. Uh, yeah. Um, and then we also check for a primary key. Here, we get the key check to see if it's a primary key, and we spit out primary key. And this all prints out uh, like SQL statements. So here in this example here, I say, I create the person here, and then I create, I call create table here, and then it outputs here what's at the bottom. So we actually call create table person um, uh, name char 250. Now, I actually pass in the person name in this example here. Like ideally, if you wanted to, you could also add, Add, um, add like a static const variable that stores the name of the table as well if you wanted to. But in this example, I just, I just pass it in. Um, so now some third party libraries to actually go along with Boost Fusion. The first thing, there is a library called CPPN that actually builds on top of Boost Fusion. Um, it uses um, it actually builds a whole entire annotation stuff. So like we're kind of manually doing the annotations ourselves in a lot of ways, but CPPN is a library that actually does, uh, that built on Boost Fusion and do, does the annotation. Uh, another library is Boost HANA. Um, that is like a modern replacement for Boost Fusion. So if you're using like the latest version of Clang or GCC, um, you can use Boost HANA possibly instead. Um, you might get a little bit of uh, a cleaner interface in, in some places and, and also much faster compilation. And there's also a library I've actually started working on, Hero, that I was trying to work on for portability reasons that would be somewhat of a modern replacement for, for, for uh, Boost Fusion. So, so now, uh, moving on to the visitor pattern. This is another technique that you can use to try to annotate your classes with uh, reflection data. Uh, essentially, the visitor pattern, um, a lot of times it's traditionally associated with like using some kind of uh, variant type. But in this case, we're actually gonna use it to actually be able to reflectively go over our data structures. So uh, essentially, we just provide like a, essentially a visit function that's gonna take the visitor and it's gonna call it for each of the member functions. Uh, uh, usually, it's a little bit easier to see it implemented. So in general, I, a good way to implement is this. I create a struct visit and I actually take in um, myself as a first parameter and a function. And for each of those functions, I call you know name, self name, age, self age. Now, for this case, I actually use, use this as a separate function rather than a member function because ideally when you do visits, you want to do visits for const and non const visits. And so essentially, if you made it a member function, you'd have to create two overloads for this. Instead, what we're doing is we're just templating ourself there, and um, uh, that way we can actually use it for both const and non-const versions. Of course, by doing that, that requires a little bit extra work by the user to start calling the visit. So in general, it's much easier to actually use a visit each function that we can actually just call that will actually go ahead and find the visit uh, object that we have and call that. Now, unfortunately, in C++, we can't just call a colon, because in this example here, I take the t ref rep, which that t could all be a, a, like a regular L value reference. So because of that, if it's a reference, if t is a reference, and I try to call colon colon on it, C++ doesn't allow it. it. It throws a fit. So what you have to do first is you have to basically remove off all of the references, or if, you, if it has a const on it, remove the const off of it. So that's what the first line basically essentially does. Yes? Oh, could I just use decay? Uh, not necessarily because decay could actually uh, decay to pointers. Well, I guess in this case it wouldn't matter. But, but decay does a bunch of other stuff too, besides just removing references. So uh, that's why I just use that, uh, this instead. 
So that's what I, I'm using here. I remove the references, it removes any console, all little keywords, so that that way I can actually do a colon colon visit and get the visit object, I call the visit object. Then I pass myself back basically into it and, I, and pass the function into it as well. So once we do this, we can actually go back and revisit our print XML function. So um, basically in this case here, instead of just taking one element in here, we'll actually take a name and a variable, and the variable is auto because it can actually represent uh, various types of string, integer, whatever. And so there now we just, we can serialize it out using name var, um, pretty simple, right? So next what we would like to be able to do is have attributes like we did before. In this case, when we define our attributes using the visitor pattern, we're not actually having to attach it to type. So we actually have something a little bit simpler. Uh, to do, um, uh, yeah. So basically, what we do here is um, we basically call the. Um, uh, so basically, we store the length. We can just store it as a regular member variable here, and we have the primary key. Uh, so um, now, when we want to be able to use those attributes, we can just add them as extra parameters onto the function. So um, max length, primary key, um, there. But by doing that, we actually need to update our XML to, we might have possibly extra parameters there. So we can add in a dot, dot, dot attributes that takes in a possible number of, of extra attributes. So, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, I feel like I skipped a bunch of slides for some reason. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay, never mind. Okay, so yeah, so the dot 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 is a very number of parameters, we, uh, uh, which for the case when you don't have any attributes, it just gets ignored. This case, we're not using attributes, but it still needs to be there because the user might actually pass them in. Now, if they do pass in a bunch of attributes, you could rely on, okay, each of these attributes have to go in certain order. When you're using primary key, you're not using primary key, you might need to put it in order, but rather it would be much better to search through all of those attributes and find out which one's the primary key. So to do that, you can use these three different overloads to actually search for a primary key. So in this case, we say all is primary key. We find the first one, it's a primary key, so we just go ahead and return true, right? We don't care what the rest of the T's are. Right? For the second case, which is completely empty, it didn't find a primary key at all, so we return false. And then for, another, for the, the last case is for when it's not a, the first type is not obviously a primary key, but the rest of the T's could be a primary key, we go ahead and call it recursively. So it kind of does this like head tail type of recursion that's kind of familiar with like functional programming. So, and you can use that to search for the primary key. The same process can happen with the get max length. In this case, we're not just returning true and false, but in this case, we're actually returning back the x dot length that we stored in the object. And if it's not found, we return basically minus one. So then we can actually go back and look at our create table function. Um, basically, in the create table, we basically take the number of attributes and basically the meat of the operation actually is going to be in the create column, right? So in the create column, we actually do, do the same kind of process, check to see if it's convertible to string. We call get max length, but we do attributes dot, 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 because there, there are many number of attributes. So we pass in all of those attributes in there, and it will basically search over it, find a max length, and give us what that max length is, if it is found, otherwise minus one. And so then we go through the same process, print out text or char. And at the same time, for we do the same thing for the is primary key attributes dot 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 dot. So now, moving on to something else you can do with visitors is there's many times when you you have visitors and you have all these attributes, you may sometimes want to only visit certain certain overloads that have certain attributes. As an example, like I had in the slides, is visiting just the ones that have the primary key attribute. So this could be very possible when you're writing an ORM that you want to do something like you get, you, you call out, you create, you insert the new data into the, the database and then you actually get a response back what that primary key is supposed to be, what it, uh, especially if the primary keys are auto generated by the database. So what this does is it, um, 
it basically just it basically selects only the elements that have the primary key attribute and then it gives you the name the value and then also the attribute that you asked for so like you can also use it for other cases besides just the primary key the primary key doesn't actually store any data but if you had other cases where you wanted to select certain visits and they had like um, and they had like um, uh, data stored in those attributes you could actually visit those um, especially if you in, in a more larger data driven environment you may actually use that to be like okay only these attributes that have this I'm gonna serialize out to here the other ones I'm gonna serialize out to someplace else so that's kind of what the visit select so we'll actually look at how you can go about doing this visit select so in this example here yeah we basically only print out at the bottom there name Tom because the name is the primary key so basically we can actually take what we were doing before when we we're searching for an attribute and try to do it in a more generic way. So we start off, we uh, uh, declare a not found struct that basically is gonna signify that we didn't find an attribute. And then inside the attribute finder class, it takes an attribute as a template parameter and that's the attribute we're gonna be searching for. And so basically we do the three call overloads like we were doing before and we actually search through uh, um, all of them and try to find that same attribute. If the attribute's found, we actually return the attribute. If the attribute's not found, we actually return back our special not found uh, 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 struct that we created. Now, now C++, because it doesn't have static if, we can't just be like, okay, now if it's, if it's a not found attribute, do this, otherwise do what we want it to do. So we can't, we can't really uh, do that directly in C++, so we have to use function overload. So one way we can do this is just overload based upon the type. So if the attribute's found, and we, we take an attribute and we take a function. So basically if the attribute's found, we go ahead and return the function, right? If on the overload and it's actually a not found, we actually don't return the function. Instead, we just return a special function that does nothing. So basically it ends up uh, basically turning that into dead code, right? So, um, so, uh, Putting that together for implement, like if we want to implement visit select, we can actually um, uh, uh, take in the attributes. We call our attribute finder that then uh, searches and finds the attribute, and then we say if found on that attribute, pass in the user provided function that they want to be called for that attribute, and then we pass in the name var and that single attribute. Now, if it's a not found, that function won't be called at all. If it is found it'll actually call the function with the name, the variable, and that attribute. So then that way you can actually select only certain visits that you want to do. And that's kind of how the visitor pattern works. So Now, finally, uh, the last thing here is the do it, I call it the do it yourself. I don't know if it's really the best name for it, but essentially what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna create uh, our own macro called reflectable. Yes? Can I ask a question at the back? Oh, yeah. You had that lambda, and it was taking an auto of the remaining periodic template arguments there. And it's like, it's like, it's like <laughs> but on your, um, in your, in your visitor handler, uh, you're just using, um, it's just a ref type. So why was it, I mean, I'd ask you probably to really figure out why, but why did the lambda use ref type? Uh, that's just a forwarding ref. Uh, um, he's qu asking the question why the, uh, the lambda used the auto ref ref. Uh, it's just kind of a habit because I just want to take something. When you use the auto ref ref, that's usually use, 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 that, use that to signify that you want to take anything that's a reference, right? Is generally when you want to use auto ref ref. So you use auto when you always want to take by value, you use auto ref ref when you always want to take by reference. And so I don't really care what the reference is because I'm not going to do anything with it. I mean, yes, later on in the code, I actually am just passing a const reference. So that is possible to do, use the const auto ref as well. But uh, in general, I just use auto ref ref to mean take a reference to anything. So good question. Uh, so now uh, the do it yourself with the uh, 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 reflectable uh, macro here. What we're going to do is create a little macro to do this. Now, I don't know. Um, Basically, this is going to take, uh, the, basically, you just list out your types here, and we'll actually put the types in parentheses. So I we'll actually look at kind of a way of, 
of doing that. Now the way, when you put your types around parentheses, I actually call that a typed expression. So um, essentially we want some utilities to kind of handle the type expression. So these are some basic macros called a strip and pair. Basically what strip does is it basically will strip off that, that uh, like at the bottom there you see the parentheses int. It will strip off the parentheses int and leaves you with just x, right? And in the case of, and so you use that like when you need to, you, you need another variable type. But there's other times like we want to be able to actually declare the, uh, the uh, field itself. So we don't, we can't declare it as in, you know, parentheses in x. So we need to declare it as in x. So, so for that case, we use pair. And what pair does is basically remove off those parentheses off the int and we're just left with the int x. So that's basically how that works. Of course, we still need a few more macros. <laughs> Um, here, so uh, we start off here with uh, uh, an inargs macro that basically just kind of counts out the number of arguments there. This actually counts it up to eight, and then we use a kind of like a, a simple pattern matching for each of those up to eight. So we basically say, okay, we take each takes a macro and it takes a varied number of arguments. And if it's you know if it has one, it calls it for the first argument. If it has two, it calls it for each argument for each, both of those arguments all the way up to eight. So it's just kind of like a repetitive thing that we can use to call up to, to apply a macro to each of those arguments. So that's how that works. Also, we need a way to actually enumerate them. So, in, in, and what I mean by enumerate is we want to be able to, when we call each of those, we can actually stick a comma in between them. So when we want to pass them on to like another little function argument, we want to actually put a comma in there. So the first thing uh, we have is we have this comma thing that will actually prepend a comma onto uh, the front of the macro. Then if you look at the enum macro, it calls each, right? But it actually change, it calls it with that comma macro, so it prepends that macro into the front of what we're doing. But when we do that, obviously because we're prepending a macro to each single element, um, it ends up adding an extra argument onto the first of the, uh, onto the front of the list, right? So we kind of want to get rid of that first argument. So that's why, where the tail comes in, and tail basically just ignores off the first of the argument and then gives us flipped over. Also, we need a way to actually stringicize the um, arguments. Um, regularly you can use the pound, like pound x right there, like you see in the, string size, the primitive string size. That will actually turn that token into a string, right? But uh, because we're actually calling it from another macro, like it, it won't it will actually string size of the macro that we're passing in. So instead we just go through a separate indirection and that's what the string size does. It goes through a separate indirection and then converts it into a string. So here's how we can start writing with these utilities, here's how we can start writing the reflectable uh, macro, essentially. So um, we first call each with a member each, and I'll show on the next slide what the member each does, but basically that line is basically going to declare each of the members. Um, into, the, into the struct. The, uh, the next part um, is we actually declare a struct called unpack. And inside there we have an apply function that will take itself and it will take a function. And for each of those functions, for, uh, for that function basically essentially will actually call each of the elements there. But we actually want to not just call each of the elements there, we actually want to um, actually have the name itself. And we'll show in that unpack each how we actually store it into a pair. So the next one you can see here, when I do member each, we call pair x semicolon, so it basically declares it as a member variable. And then for the other one, for the unpack each, it basically calls a, a stood pair and stuffs the first, the first part is going to be the name. So we string size the name, the strip x, which will give us the name of that field. And then the second part will just be self dot strip x that will give us the, um, uh, that will actually access the field in the class. So finally putting it finally together, we can actually call, we can create our own for each function that I, we can actually use to um, uh, basically iterate over all of the elements that we've actually set up. So basically that works. We use a similar case like we did before where we had to use the remove const because we, because we can't call the scope operator on something that's a reference. So we, we do that, we call apply, and then we pass in our lambda that takes all the different uh, elements that's, that are in that struct all together at once. But we want to actually apply that function to each of those arguments. 
So this actually uses a, a, a thing from, actually, I think Sean Parent tweeted something very similar to this where we yeah, actually... I have a talk on that. Oh, okay. Thursday. Okay, he has a talk on that on uh, Thursday. But um, it basically, basically uh, we expand, we expand, when we call the dot, 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 we're going to expand each of those, that, that uh, function call um, for each of those x, s. So it would actually call that uh, function for each of those. And then um, we actually put it in the initializer list. And the reason for this is because when we, uh, by default, you can't uh, ensure the ordering for each of these functions by default if you try to pass it on to like a regular function. But inside of initializer list, you're actually guaranteed that it's going to be from uh, uh, left to right. So that's why it goes into the initializer list. And since the initializer list only takes integers, that's why at the end I do comma zero there. So it basically converts it to basically an integer, the result of, of that function to an integer, and it only puts a bunch of zeros in there. But it has the side effect of calling each of the functions from left to right. So essentially by doing that, we can actually now have a for each function that we can actually call for each of our elements. And we can actually then actually implement print XML like we did for the other example. So we, we call print XML, we call our for each on it. Uh, and we can basically do data.first will actually give us the name. And then data.second will actually give us the, um, the value that's associated with it. So that's that. So. We have time for about one question. Anyone? So, which of these solutions and where have you been used before? Um, the last solution I didn't really use that much, but um, I used a variant of that at one point to be actually develop uh, it using, so it actually supported like getters and setters and things like that using kind of a similar, uh, it used a similar kind of thing that how queue properties worked. Um, but in general, um, I kind of tend towards the, uh, using like Boost Fusion in the visitor pattern. So if you're able to use Boost, or other libraries kind of like Boost Hand or Boost Hana. If you're able to use those libraries, it's better to kind of tend towards using a library-based solution. But if you're at a place that's like, okay, we can't, we don't have Boost, we don't want to, we don't need a dependency on Boost, then sometimes it's actually better to lean towards using the visitor pattern. It's actually fairly simple to write. It just uses basic C++. It doesn't have any ma major library dependencies on it. So, just a simple question. I've used Qt in the mock for its reflection capabilities in the past. You haven't really mentioned on that. I was just curious if how that compares in your mind to what you discussed today. Oh yeah, um, yeah. There's Qt that does it. It's actually what we I was kind of focusing on more of, of is compile time based uh, reflection. Qt's mock is actually more of a runtime reflection, and it's not even entirely C plus plus because it requires an extra step in the process. What I was trying to focus in on this talk is actually doing stuff that actually only, that basically essentially just runs basically in C++ and you don't need a separate build step. Because there's, there's some other solutions too that actually you can read the metadata using like libclang and then it will actually go out and generate some extra files for you so that you can do reflection as well. There's, there's, there's several tools that do that um, so as well. Um, but the QT, the QT is actually, as uh, just since you mentioned it, 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 it relies on getters and setters when you do it, besides running the mock. So like in this example, I was able to just take a plain struct and actually basically essentially make it uh, uh, work with the uh, reflection framework. If, if at all means, like if you need to like actually, um, like if you don't have the need for having the getters and setters, maybe you, you have certain requirements, you need these actually to be plain old data types for whatever reason, like say since you're interfacing with like HDF5 or some kind of other type of format that kind of, or C API that kind of requires that, then you can't really instrument it with getters and setters. You can't, you, uh, you also can't use the mock with it because it requires inheriting from Q object. So uh, these techniques, like, like especially the first two techniques, you can still meet the requirements of having a plain old data type to interface with C, plus on, on the other side of it, you can get reflection data about it.
mentioned at the beginning that the uh, the, the yes, compile exactly. time data could be used to serialize serialize out for uh, produce data that the, the runtime data right yeah so essentially what you could do like instead of like I have the example where I print the XML instead you could just create like a static map or whatever in your in your data structure and then you can essentially instead of doing the for each and printing out the XML you just fill up that map that static map that's associated with that type. And by doing that, you can essentially have the runtime data, and then you just need a mechanism to query based on that type to query for that map. So that's how you can generate your runtime data. Quick, quick question, will your code be up on GitHub? Uh, this code? It will be up on GitLab, actually, uh, for the presentation. All the code in the presentation will be on GitLab, uh, which I should be publishing here in the next I don't know when they're going to release it for the conference, but uh, yeah, it, it will be out on GitLab, so you can actually take a look at it. And it all compiles and, and runs as well, so. Uh, you, mentioned you mentioned at the beginning that there was a, a study group that was looking into runtime reflection for C++. What's the name of that group, or um, do you follow them or anything? Yeah, I, can, I don't remember the number for it, if it's well, S it's like SG, it's SG, it's not SG8, I think that's the concepts one. Maybe it's SG4? I don't, I don't remember the, which one it is. I'd have to Google and look it up. Sorry. It's one of the SG groups. Yeah, it's one of the SG groups, yeah. Thanks. Um, you're aware that T-U-P-L-E is pronounced tuple, right? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I mean, it's kind of like tomato, tomato. Tuple, tuple. <laughs> I say tuple. Oh, okay. Tuple is in common usage as well. Yeah. 